Steve Johnson was sitting outside his wife's office at 7 o'clock at night because that was the day he was going to end the charade he and his wife had been calling a marriage. Some husbands missed the signs. Extra hours at work, when she never worked them before. Dressing nicer. Girls' nights out. Decrease in intimacy at home. Not Steve. He noticed and he was done with it. Steve estimated that it had been going on for two months. It was then that he noticed the first time his wife, Angela, wore a pair of red high heels to work. She disliked wearing heels. The only time she would tolerate them was for the occasional wedding or other special occasion and when she dressed up in the bedroom. She would wear the red heels and white stockings on certain occasions. Steve loved the white thigh-high stockings and loved seeing her in heels. He thought that they had a great love life. But she never wore high heels to work, and he asked her about it. What's with the heels, honey? Something going on today, he asked. She stopped walking for a moment, then continued without turning around and said, I have a review meeting with my boss today. I just want to look professional. He didn't respond but thought. A professional lady of the evening maybe but let it go. Then the extra hours at work started. At first it was an hour here or there, but later became two to three hours several days a week. Once the girl's night out started, he knew what was really happening. She disliked clubs, lounges, and bars. Her idea of going out was for dinner or coffee. She didn't drink a drop and looked down on people who did. He followed her on the third girl's night out, and she went to a house in Glen Ellen. He knew the house, he'd been there several times for parties. It was her boss Martin Schindler's house. Steve waited an hour, and when he was confident that that was her plan, and not just a stop on the way, he let the air out of all four of her tires and drove home. She didn't mention the tires when she got home that night or over the weekend, but he heard her tell Jenny. Would you believe someone let the air out of my tires last night? No way, really, Jenny said. Yep. Thank goodness they didn't slash them. They just let the air out. I was able to use that air pump thingy your dad makes me keep in the trunk. Wow. Where'd you go just a dancing club with my friends? You should probably avoid it in the future, Angela smirked and said, sure baby Steve met with an attorney and started the divorce process. That was why he was sitting outside of her office. She was going to be served that night. He lamented about the 21 years of marriage, but overall they were good. They had a 17-year-old daughter, Jenny, who was the apple of his eye and a daddy's girl. He met Angela when he needed a lawyer for a contract dispute with his employer. Back then, she was a receptionist who wanted to be a paralegal. He thought she was beautiful and asked her out. They dated happily for two years before he proposed, and he thought they were happy for the entirety of their marriage. Right up until she started working for Martin Schindler. He drove a truck and at times had long hours, but they spent as much time together as possible. As a family, they went on weekend trips as Jenny's schedule allowed. She always had one sport going on or some other activity taking up time. Occasionally, Steve and Angela would go to Galena, Illinois to visit wineries or Lake Geneva, Wisconsin to shop and relax, without Jenny when she was old enough. The shock of Angela's betrayal cut him deeply. She had an attitude with him more and more, but he had never suspected she was cheating until he noticed the heels. It was downhill from there. Her attitude had been bad and progressively worse. He recalled the conversation on that night he followed her. Honey, why don't we go out to dinner and a movie tonight? I've got a rare Friday off and I want to spend some time with you, he said. You know I go out with the girls now on Fridays. They rely on me to be their designated driver. Let them Uber for one night. With the extra hours you've been working and these nights out you're doing now, I hardly see you anymore. Well, if you had a real job, one that didn't cause you to drive at all hours of the evening and overnight, you might be able to see me more. You don't though, and I've had to deal with it for two decades. Suck it up, I'll see you later. She didn't even say goodbye when she walked out the door. He was speechless. He followed her into the garage and watched her pull out. He grabbed his keys and hurried out after her. There was only one way out of their subdivision, and it was a maze of streets to get to the exit from their house. He was able to catch up to her as she turned onto Main Street and followed her to Martin's house. He avoided her the rest of that weekend and resolved to find a lawyer on Monday. He wasn't going to fight dirty, he just wanted an even split and amicable end to the marriage. He felt that through her words and actions, she didn't want him anymore, so why hold on to a slippery rope? She could have her boss without a fight from him, 
is how he felt. He told his daughter about it that Monday. She's cheating on me, Pumpkin. You may not see the difference over the last couple of months, but I can. She's checked out of the marriage and is involved with her boss, No Way Daddy. I don't believe it. I followed her to his house. She said she was going out with friends. She did not. She went to her boss' house, but her tires were tampered with at the club, No Sweetheart. I did it. And I did it at the guy's house when I saw that she wasn't going to a club. I just can't believe it. Daddy Maine either. But it's true his daughter was sitting next to him waiting for the inevitable fireworks to start. Are you really sure, Daddy? There's no chance, Jenny asked. No, sweetheart. It's over. She broke my trust and my heart. I can't condone that kind of betrayal. What if she felt like she had a reason to do it? Sweetheart, there is no reason to justify a long-term affair. If she got drunk and it was a one-time thing, maybe. If she were hurt, of course that would be different. No. She chose this path. She betrayed my trust. Trust is the most important thing you can have with someone. You can't truly love someone that you can't trust. I could never love someone who betrayed me like that. Our marriage is over. Jenny looked out the window and saw two men approaching the car. Such an idiot Angela Johnson said looking out the window of their law office as Marty got close to her, glad for the one-way, gold-tinted windows. It took him six months to bring Angela in, and he was preparing her to replace his wife who just got the final divorce decree, ending their 19-year marriage. He got tired of his ex-wife's complaining and whining about everything. He was tired of her weight gain, he was embarrassed to be seen with her, and when his twins left for college, he broke away. Angela was the same age as his wife, but she was more sophisticated. She had the fit body of a 30-year-old and was remarkably beautiful. Martin was already improving her wardrobe and she was going to make a great partner's wife. The knock on the window startled Steve. Are you Stephen Johnson rolling down the window? He said, yes, you've been served. Please read the documents carefully. There is a restraining order requiring you to stay 100 yards from Angela Johnson, Jennifer Johnson, and your marital residence. What? A restraining order? From Jenny Jenny grabbed the envelope from his hand and read the header for the dissolution of marriage. She found the restraining order and handed it to him. What in the world? He shouted. Oh my goodness, no, Jenny said. Daddy, I swear, I didn't know what are you talking about. She handed him the other papers. In the documentation, it outlined several accusations. Spousal abuse, child abuse, inappropriate conduct with a minor, Jenny, why, Daddy, I swear, I had nothing to do with that. It's a lie or a mistake. Wait. How did she know I would be here right now? It's because I told her, his daughter said. The words shattered his heart. When you told me she was cheating on you, I confronted her. She told me that she only did it because she had an investigator's report saying you were cheating on her. You can't be serious. Did you see the report? No, you believed her and not me. You let her set me up? Baby, why? I love you so much. Why did you do this to me? I asked you not to say anything. I promise I didn't know about the restraining order. That abuse thing is completely false, I swear. I didn't say anything like that to anyone. He silently cried, ignoring her pleas. Moments later he said, You have to leave now, Jenny. I can't be within 100 yards of you anymore, he said softly. Daddy, no, she shouted. Go. Or I could be arrested on top of all of this. The sheriff is still here watching me. Reading more, he said, Oh no, they froze all of my accounts too. What am I going to do now? Congratulations to you both. You've destroyed me. I can't even afford to fight her. High-powered law firm with all of these false claims. I'll be fighting in court forever. Oh no, I'll fix this, Daddy, she said, as she left the car and ran to the office building. Martin erupted into Angela's laughter and sighed a breath of relief. That was great, she said. I just wish I had binoculars so I could see his face. Martin was just buckling his belt, and Angela was smoothing her dress when a screaming Jenny ran into the office. You monster. What is wrong with you, Jenny screamed. I had to have the advantage, Angela said. I had to strike first. Now he can't get into the house or have access to my money for a while. Now I have the upper hand on him. He didn't hurt me, I don't know that for sure. You two are very close, Angela said with a smirk. Jenny walked up to her and asked, He didn't cheat, did he? Of course not. 
Who would want him, she said with a laugh. You're horrible, Jenny said as she clenched her fist to punch, but instead slapped her mother with all of her strength. Angela went down to the ground in shock and pain. Martin laughed and said, Nice hit, kid. Jenny froze, then looked around. She saw bookcases, shelves, and a messy desk. She smiled, looked at Martin, and swept everything off of his desk. Jenny looked at him and calmly said, You better never cross my path again. I can and will do worse and walked out. Jenny, wait, Angela screamed. Martin said, That little nuisance is going to pay for this as she walked out. She passed a man with an envelope in his hand who asked her, Are you? Angela Johnson in the office, she said, and stormed off. Both Angela and Martin laughed at her being served Steve's petition for divorce. Jenny tried desperately to talk to her father. Out of fear, he knew he couldn't talk to her, so he didn't answer and cried every time he saw her call. He was afraid Angela would find out and send the police after him for violating the restraining order. Angela had already alienated him from all of their friends, and only his parents and brother believed his innocence. His sister-in-law wouldn't let him near his niece and nephew, just in case it was true. That almost ended her marriage to his brother before George had Jenny tell her the truth. He couldn't figure out what he did to earn that much hatred from Angela and his daughter's betrayal. Even if she didn't know about the abuse allegation, she still told her mother that he knew about her affair and when she would be served. She even lied and said she wanted to be with him to support him when he had Angela served. But she knew he was being served and said nothing. Jenny tried to find someone to help her daddy. She found her mother's copy of the divorce papers and saw that the attorney worked at her mom's office, so going to him was out. She called Grandpa George. George was Steve's father, and she hoped he could help. What do you want, young lady, he said. Grandpa, we have to help Daddy. I don't know who to go to to get him help. He isn't taking my calls. I can't believe what you did to your dad, Jenny. What were you thinking by helping your mother? Grandpa, it's all lies. I didn't do anything. It's all my mom and her lawyer boyfriend watch your mouth. Girl, sorry, Grandpa. I promise I didn't accuse him of any of that, and I had no idea that when I confronted her, she would go nuclear like this. All right. I'll see what I can do, Grandpa. Is he there? Can I talk to him? He can't have any contact with you until that order is killed. Every time you call him, he breaks down crying because of what's happened. He's afraid your mother will find out he spoke to you and turn him into the police. His lawyer said that there's a court date set up to have a hearing on it coming up, but nothing can be done until then Jenny, crying herself, said, Grandpa, tell him I love him and miss him if I see him. I will Jenny hung up and cried for several minutes. When she was finally composed, she went into her mother's room and started taking her lingerie from the drawers and her newest clothes from the closet and threw them down the stairs she picked up the big pile, carried it out the front door, and threw it into the middle of the lawn. She laughed when she saw that some of the outfits were so new they had their tags still on them. I can't stand you, mother. She said out loud and went to the shed to get the lighter fluid. She doused the clothes with the entire can and used the aim and flame to light it. She noticed that the time was close to when her mother would be home. Jenny smiled as she got an idea. As she pulled into the driveway, Angela saw Jenny sitting on a lawn chair in the front yard, roasting a marshmallow over a pile of her burning clothes. She screamed and ran out of the car, yelling at Jenny. What the heck are you doing? Have you lost your mind? No, mother. I'm perfectly sane. I've decided to make you pay for my daddy not being able to talk to me. Every day that goes by, until I speak to him, I'm going to destroy some more of your stuff. You'd better drop that false abuse claim as fast as possible, or more of your stuff goes up in flames, Jenny. There's a court date on Monday. It will not be renewed. It was only for a short time, don't care, mother. Until I talk to him, your things go up and smoke darn it, Angela screamed as she went into the house. She called Steve. But of course he didn't answer, and he deleted the message without listening to it. Moments later, a fire truck and a police car pulled up. One of the neighbors reported the fire. The policeman and one of the firemen walked up to Jenny. What's all this about young lady, the officer asked. My mom wanted to get rid of some clothes that she grew out of. She told me to do a bonfire with them, Jenny said. You can't have a bonfire in the front yard. Is she home, he asked. Yes, sir. I'll put it out with the hose if you want. The fireman spoke up and asked, 
Did you use anything to light it, or did you just light the clothes a whole can of charcoal lighter fluid, she said. No, no water. We've got some sand I'll throw on it, the fireman said. While the fireman dealt with the fire, the police officer rang the doorbell. Angela opened the door ready to confront, but realized it was the police. Great, we'll put the fire out. It's no big deal, Officer Angela said before he could speak. Firemen are doing that now, Ma Am. You know it's against city ordinance to have an uncontrolled bonfire in your front yard, no. I didn't know, she said through gritted teeth. Here's your ticket. It's just a fine. No court appearance required. Next time, Ma Am, just give em to Goodwill or Saint. Vincent DePaul. Less fortunate folks could use that stuff, she screamed. A as she closed the door. Angela's lawyer appeared before the judge at the hearing for the restraining order the next Monday. He didn't fight the appeal of it, knowing it was falsely obtained. It served its purpose and bought time and ruined Steve's reputation. Steve's lawyer made a motion to file a perjury charge against Angela. The judge said, without definitive proof that the order was filed under false pretenses, there's been no perjury. You can open that can of worms in your countersuit in the divorce case, but you know it's grasping at straws. The fact that the restraining order was dropped provided little solace to Steve, who was in a horrible state of depression. His life was falling apart because he couldn't handle the false accusations, frozen assets, cheating wife, and what he felt was the worst part of it all his daughter's betrayal. He was barely getting by mentally. He took time off of work, he felt hopeless, and he was miserable to be around. He went to his house during the day when he knew Angela and his daughter wouldn't be there. He found that she changed the locks, but he tried his garage door opener and it worked. Inside the garage, he found all of his belongings. There were several boxes in his clothes were in trash bags. He noticed that she left him the wedding album and all of the pictures of the happy family that used to be spread around the house. He took those out, piled them in front of the door connected to the house and urinated on them. He kept in contact with his parents and his brother but relationships were being strained due to his problems. His parents begged him to see a psychiatrist, but he refused. He felt he didn't need a therapist to tell him that his life sucked and there was nothing he could do about it. Angela's law firm fought a campaign of war with no mercy. She even told his employer about the restraining order and the accusations of abuse and Steve was fired for cause. His contract had a morals clause, if he were in a better state of mind, he would have known that he could fight it and likely win, but he was just going through the motions at that point. No one knew where Steve was living. His only contact with his family was by phone. The only time anyone saw him was when he had a mandatory court appearance related to the divorce and he refused to speak to anyone except his attorney and the judge. Jenny tried to speak to him on those occasions and cried every time he walked past her without looking at her. She thought that he looked like a dead man walking. Angela was happy with how everything was progressing. She had started resenting Steve months before, as Martin had turned her against him, and had built up over the course of his relationship an almost hatred in her of Steve. After months of going back and forth in court, the divorce was finally declared final. Steve was able to get his share of his belongings returned to him. His lawyer was able to make them sell the house, but Steve kept his truck. Unfortunately, Steve was having a hard time finding a job because false rumors were spreading around the town that he had mistreated his daughter. Even though he wasn't charged with anything, no one seemed to care. Feeling frustrated and hopeless, Steve decided to move to Chicago in search of work. Thankfully, he was able to find a job as a truck driver in his field. He packed all of his belongings into the back of his truck and went to say goodbye to his parents. As he was saying goodbye, Jenny, his daughter, arrived. Daddy, I'm so sorry. None of this should have happened, she said as she ran up and hugged him. Steve couldn't bring himself to hug her back. You chose your mother over me without any evidence. Your decision caused a chain reaction of events. I had to file for divorce first because of the law firm she worked for. I needed to catch her off guard so that she couldn't retaliate. Hopefully you can understand why. Daddy, I didn't realize. I'm so sorry. I'm leaving now. The false accusations of child abuse won't go away. Once you're accused of something like that, it's a reputation that's hard to clean. Someday, your mother and her partner will face the consequences. Goodbye, Jennifer. 
I loved you more than anything in this world. I did everything I could to give you a good life. I just hope you didn't turn out like your mother she broke down in sobs as her grandmother comforted her. This gave Steve the chance to get into his truck and drive away. Angela, will you marry me? Martin asked on the day his divorce was finalized. Yes, Martin. Oh yes, she cried and jumped up to hug him, causing a small scene in the restaurant. Let's go to your place and celebrate, she said as he paid the bill. She adored Martin's beautiful house and couldn't wait to move in and make it their own. Getting rid of the outdated furniture and curtains that his ex-wife chose was a priority, especially the bedroom set. Martin couldn't help but snicker when he saw his ex-wife, Carol, having dinner with her parents. Carol was furious at Martin and his new partner. She spat at him as they walked by, but Martin didn't even bother to acknowledge her. Steve entered the truck depot and found Sweet Louisiana waiting at the door. Steve-o, what's wrong, man? You look so upset the divorce was finalized today. Ah. Well, after what that horrible woman did to you, you should be celebrating instead. It's not her, it's my child. She took her mother's side, and I just can't get over it. She calls and emails me, but I can't bring myself to respond. Maybe I should see a therapist, maybe you should have some fun, came a voice from behind them. Hey, Marianne. Not a bad idea, Lou said. Hey. Who would want an old person like me, Steve replied. Marianne leaned in and whispered, I do. Big boy then playfully flicked his earlobe with her tongue. She walked away, and the men watched her as she left. Go for it, Steve-o. She's a wonderful woman, what the hell? Why not, Steve answered. That's my boy. Now let's hit the road for their first date. Steve took Marianne to dinner and a movie. After the movie, they went to a cafe for coffee and pie. Steve, you need to stay positive. You're a good person who had bad luck. Things will work out eventually, she said. Maybe, Marianne. For a long time, I couldn't understand what I did wrong. I didn't know why she fought so hard against me during the divorce. She even accused me of being an abuser and molester. She's terrible. And it's all in the past now, she said, holding his hand. Look ahead, not behind. I promise to make it worth your while he smiled and squeezed her hand. Let's get out of here, shall we? Marianne pulled Steve in for a hug as she opened her front door. Want to see something special? Big boy I would love to she held his hand and guided him to her bedroom. The moonlight shining through the window gave the room a comforting glow. They hugged passionately. They wanted to savor every moment. She lay on the bed while he kneeled on the floor. He jokingly said, Lou owes me ten bucks, Hugh. Why I told him you were a natural redhead, and he bet against it. She laughed. As they were together, she whispered, Your ex is a fool, she only cared about his money, not him well. Her loss is my gain, and I plan on taking full advantage of it, they hugged, and Steve said, Anytime, honey. Anytime. A week later, a figure dressed in black approached the back door of a large house in an upscale neighborhood. Prepared to break in, they were pleasantly surprised to find the door unlocked. Quietly, they moved through the house, being careful not to make any noise. They eventually found the room they were looking for. This room was exactly as they had seen it in a Facebook photo of their target sitting at his desk. The arrogant man had even made it his cover photo. The room's layout was perfect for what they needed to do. The only concern was if their target visited the closet before sitting at the desk. However, this wouldn't stop them from completing the job. They had a solid alibi to protect themselves. Martin Schindler entered his home office and glanced at his computer monitor, which was at an angle on his desk. He had his back turned completely to the closet. The intruder quietly opened the closet door and carefully moved into the room. Martin heard a noise and turned around. A gun was pressed against his temple, and before he knew it, a shot was fired. The gun was placed in Martin's hand, and a short note was left on his desk. The shooter quickly left the room. The debt has been paid was all the note said. Angela returned home after shopping and walked into Martin's office to show him the new bedding she had bought. She let out a scream when she saw Martin's lifeless body in the chair, blood slowly dripping onto the floor. She took out her phone, called 911, and reported the shooting. She looked at the gun in Martin's hand and the note on the desk. She didn't touch anything but read the note and understood the message. No, Steve, no, she cried. What have you done? Detective Devante Jordan received the call and rushed over to the Schindler house. 
As he arrived, he saw a distraught woman in the living room and crime scene technicians going in and out of the office. He carefully observed the scene and noticed a new set of golf clubs in the corner of the room. Nice clubs, he thought to himself before continuing his investigation. He examined the body and saw the gun still clutched in the victim's hand. He asked one of the officers who arrived first, what do we know so far seems like it's a case of self-inflicted gunshot. The victim is Martin Schindler, the homeowner and an attorney. His fiance is Angela Johnson. She found the body and called 911. Is there a note? Yes, sir. It's typed and doesn't have a signature. Here it is the officer handed him a plastic bag containing the note. Detective Jordan frowned and said, is the fiance the blonde woman in there? Yes, sir, my am. Do you have any idea what the note means? Detective Jordan asked Angela. Yes, it means it wasn't suicide. My ex-husband killed him. Martin hates guns. He didn't own one. Why do you think your ex did this? Because he felt Martin took me from him. Did he? Were you seeing the deceased while you were married looking down embarrassed? She said. For a short time, yes, could there be anyone else who may have wanted him dead? He was an attorney, right? I guess his ex-wife was pretty upset about being dumped. He did corporate law. Civil clients that hardly ever saw a courtroom okay ma am. Where were you tonight shopping? You don't think I did it. I don't even know that it wasn't a suicide yet. Could you get your receipts for me please okay Detective Steve Johnson was visited by Detective Jordan on a sunny Sunday afternoon. Mr. Johnson, I'm Detective Jordan. I need to ask you a few questions please. Sure, detective. What's up, where were you last night at around 8 p.m. working? I was driving the rig through Rockford. I pulled into the depot at 9.30. You could check the logs, where were you coming in from? Addison. What happened, Martin Schindler was shot last night in an apparent suicide apparent. Let's just say there are some inconsistencies. Okay. Well, I couldn't have heard him from Rockford. No, sir. If I have any more questions I'd like to call, if that's okay, sure. I'll give you my new cell number the detective left and wasn't happy that he had to drive to northwestern Chicago to talk to Steve, and then to the other side of town to the truck depot to verify the alibi. He thought some more about what was bothering him about the suicide. Why would a left-handed man shoot himself with his right hand? Why did he type the note? Why was the gunshot residue on his hand such a small amount? It was present and would hold up that the victim fired the gun, but it was strange. After the detective left, Steve sat at his kitchen table where he was talking with Sweet Lou. What was that all about, Steve? Steve laughed and said, Would you believe? My ex's fiancé hoffed himself no kidding. Yep. I hope my alibi checks out. They laughed and clinked their beer bottles together in a toast. Angela was sitting in the front row of the funeral, crying over the man who stole her away from her wonderful husband so easily. Tears were being shed over the man who convinced her to go nuclear and ruin a good man so she could trade up. She had been deeply in love with her truck-driving husband up until she was transferred to work for Martin. Martin targeted her and began to wear her down almost immediately. Mean comments about truck drivers, careless comments about him when he was out of town, it was too easy for Martin. He planted the seed that she was neglected by Steve's long days and sometimes overnight runs, and it grew. She couldn't decide if she was crying for the loss of her fiancé or the loss of her husband and the death of her relationship with her daughter. It was all a waste. She didn't hear nor would she have cared about the whispers going around about her. She didn't see the glare she was getting from Martin's ex and his daughters. They blamed her for his death. You could have come to the funeral and paid your respects, Angela said, walking up to her daughter who was home for the weekend from college. Jenny glared at her and said, how dare you tell me that I'm supposed to pay respect to a man that destroyed my father? Screw you, mother. I shouldn't even have referred to that piece of garbage as a man. He's less than dirt on my shoe. She slammed the door as she walked out of the house and drove the long drive back to school in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Detective Jordan sat in a meeting with his commander going over the lack of progress in the case. All of the suspects' alibis check out. Steve Johnson's truck tracker shows he made no stops on his way from Madison to Chicago and the trip time was correct. The warehouse crew identified him as the driver. Angela Johnson's receipts and the surveillance cameras place her at Macy's, Victoria's Secret and Starbucks, and the medical examiner's window for the time of death. Schindler's ex and her daughters were having dinner with her parents and her brother and sister-in-law for her birthday. Jordan said, 
It was the ex's birthday his commander asked. No, they were just celebrating it. Heck, I even checked out Johnson's daughter, and she was at school over three hours away in Wisconsin. No chance it was suicide. His commander asked. It's possible, it just doesn't feel right well, with no suspects, no motive, and no concrete evidence that it was even a murder. Close it as a suicide. Jordan nodded and left the room, frustrated. Six months later, Angela had Jason Davis over for dinner. That was their third date, and Angela took him to bed. After a night of passionate moments, Jason went home. He cracked a beer before going to bed and sat down to check his email. As he sat at the kitchen table, the gun was put to his head and fired. The gun was placed in his hand and a note was left. The price is paid in full. Detective Jordan walked through the apartment to the kitchen. Before he could speak, the suicide note was handed to him. Well darn, looks like I was right about the other one. Now I just have to figure out who the heck did it, he said to the officer. Any fingerprints? Mark, he asked the technician. Yeah, but if I had to guess right now, I'd say they are the victims. Any witnesses? Who called it in Jordan asked. Neighbor heard the shot and called 911. No one saw anyone come or go. Of course not. How'd they get in? No broken locks or windows. It looks like the balcony to me. The sliding door wasn't locked. The victim probably didn't worry about it with him being on the second floor. It wouldn't be too difficult to climb up, though. I'd say anyone of reasonably average height could jump and reach the bottom and pull themselves up average height for male or female average male. A tall woman, where's the guy's phone, Jordan asked. Secured in a bag over here, Jordan used his gloved hands to look for his last call. Just had to check. The last call was made to an Angela. I will be surprised if she isn't Angela Johnson after going through the usual condolences and pleasantries. The detective got to work. M.S. Johnson, why do your partners seem eager to kill themselves? Detective Jordan asked. It's got to be Steve. This is him punishing me. Where were you last night? Ma, and I was at home all night. I have an alarm system that can verify that tell me about the alarm system. When it's set, it detects any doors and windows opening. I set it when Jason left last night and turned it off this morning when you came by, she said through tears. Did you turn it off at any time last night? No. Jenny is at school, so it would have been active all night MMH. That's easy enough to check on. So your theory is that your husband is behind these suicides that aren't yes. Who else could it be? When was the last time you spoke to your husband? Before the divorce, have you seen him following you? Or has he contacted you? No. How would he know about your most recent partner? Then I don't know. But it has to be him okay. That's all I have for now. Please stay close by, he said, turning to leave. Oh, one more thing. How tall are you? Around 5A. 5'10". Why, just curious. Sorry again for your loss, same MO, the commander said, back at the police station. Yes, sir, Detective Jordan said. Keep me updated daily on your progress. This is too coincidental. I've heard of a person to die for, but never someone that makes you want to kill yourself the girlfriend's alibi is solid. I'll see if I can break it, but we'll see. I'm on my way to her ex-husband now, the detective said warily. Off you go then. Let me know what you find right as Detective Jordan walked away. He had a bad feeling that all of the prime suspect's alibis would be just as solid as last time. Steve and Marianne were snuggling on his couch, binge watching Jack Ryan on Prime, when the doorbell rang. Detective Jordan, what can I do for you today, Steve, asked motioning him in. Sir, where were you last night at 1.30 a.m.? I was on the road on my way back from Detroit. I pulled in at 2.30. What happened now do you know Jason Davis don't think so he was seeing your ex-wife? He seemingly shot himself last night. No kidding? Seemingly, huh? Maybe she's a black widow serial killer or something maybe. Thank you. If I need anything else... I'll be in touch, Steve laughed as he closed the door. What was that all about, baby? Marianne asked. Looks like another of my ex-wife's boyfriends died. Oh my God, she gasped as she brought her hand to her mouth. Yep, thank God I have an alibi. I hope whoever is killing them keeps picking times when I'm on the road. Steve's cell phone rang. He looked and saw it was Jenny, so he ignored it. Marianne frowned and said, There's never going to be a chance for her. Don't see how she misses you. She reached out to me and we've spoken. What he shouted as he stood up. Relax, honey, she said, pulling him back down. I'm not going to interfere. 
It's your decision and you have to live with it. She is still your Facebook friend. She saw when I tagged you at the sushi joint I made you try last month. She stalks your Facebook. Just like you stalk hers. She texted me just to see how you were and to say that she was happy that you found someone you're happy with. She told me she will never stop trying to talk with you. She calls me once a week or so just to chat. She likes to hear where you've gone and where you're going. She was interested that I schedule your runs and have control over your schedule. She said that I can always make sure to have you home when I need you home, and that would help our relationship, unlike with your ex. She always did want to know what cities I saw. We would talk for hours about the places, people, and things I saw on the road, ever since she was little. When she was a child, I had a lot of overnight runs that got me back early. I'd make her breakfast, we'd eat, and I'd tell her about my trip. He sighed at the fond memories. Marianne, I love you, but please stay out of it. She embraced him and said, I'm not pressuring you. I'll never force you into anything. It's completely your decision. I explicitly told her that I wouldn't put you two together, he nodded, gave her a tight hug, and resumed watching the show. I don't have any evidence that connects her to the crime scene, boss. There's no sign of forced entry, no fingerprints or footprints, and no inconsistencies in the blood splatter pattern. If it weren't for the identical notes, I would consider both cases as suicides. Detective Jordan informed his commander. Is the ex-husband's alibi solid, the commander inquired. Absolutely airtight damn. Have you looked into Schindler's ex as a possible motive for revenge? Yes, she was at a club, caught on security cameras, with her new boyfriend. Her children were away at school dam. Two years later, Angela deviated from her usual pattern and began dating Lance Forrest. She had made a promise to herself not to put anyone's life at risk by dating them multiple times after the suicides. Though she hadn't remained celibate, she had limited herself to one-time encounters with people she met at bars. However, after contracting an STD, she changed her mind and decided to take a chance and pursue a stable relationship. After a month of dating Lance, she started feeling comfortable. Some might even say complacent. She stopped hiding their relationship and began openly dating him in public. Lance was watching a ball game at home when someone held a gun to his temple and pulled the trigger. The gun was then placed in his hand and a familiar note was left behind. The debt has been paid and full detective Jordan picked up his cell phone and answered the call. This is Jordan High Detective, it's Detective Stan Anson with Schaumburg. What can I help you with? Man, I think I may have a lead that connects to one of your cold cases which won the suicides with the paid in full note. I think I may have one no kidding. Any ties to Angela Johnson? Yes, she was his girlfriend no way. Was the ex-husband's alibi solid Jordan asked? Yep, he was driving through Madison where was she at home alone last time. Her security system provided an alibi that we couldn't break. Is it the same this time? This time, there was a Chinese food delivery. Angela ordered it from her home phone, and it arrived 30 minutes before the shooting took place. According to the neighbor who called 911, the shot was fired within that time frame. It's a 23-minute drive from her house to the deceased's apartment, plus a three-flight walk upstairs. It's close, but we can't see how she could have done it within that window. I agree, damn. Let's meet tomorrow and compare our case files okay once again. All alibis were airtight, and there were no new suspects. The cases remained unsolved. Steve and Marianne sat in the spacious auditorium, watching Jenny as she walked across the stage to receive her bachelor's degree. Steve beamed with pride and had to wipe away a tear as it threatened to roll down his cheek. Marianne squeezed his hand tightly and hugged him. After the ceremony, they walked to their car, and Marianne asked him, Honey, you love her so much. Why don't you call her? No, she made her choice when she took her mother's side over mine. She only realized her mistake when she felt guilty about what her mother did to me. I needed her support, I was in the right, but she didn't believe me and allowed her mother to ruin my life. Did you know that there are old friends of mine who still believe I did something inappropriate to Jenny and got away with it? Marianne nodded. No, she made her decision, and we have to live with it, he concluded. Marianne frowned at his stubbornness, grabbed his hand, and said, Were you always this stubborn before your divorce? No. Not at all five years later, Angela and Jenny sat in the front row of the funeral home, attending Steve Johnson's wake and funeral procession. 
Steve had lost his battle to pancreatic cancer, four weeks after walking Jenny down the aisle at her wedding. Although he had a few new friends and co-workers who attended, his small family was present. However, he hadn't rebuilt a large network of friends after the divorce. Most of his former friends, neighbors, and co-workers came to pay their respects to the good man they had known but lost touch with over the years. His girlfriend, Marianne, was there. They never married, but she made an effort not to show her resentment towards Angela for the pain she had caused Steve. His best friend, Lou DeMarco, shared stories with Jenny about her dad's last few years. He filled her heart with tales she would have never known otherwise. It was Marianne who finally convinced Steve to reconnect with Jenny when he was diagnosed as terminal. For years, he had thrown away letters, deleted emails, and ignored calls. Their reunion happened at the perfect time, as he and Marianne knew that those were his last months. Jenny moved her wedding day up, despite the additional costs and rushed preparations. But she got her deepest wish her father walked her down the aisle. Their tearful reunion and walk down the aisle provided Steve with a final sense of peace before he lost his last battle. The last words he spoke were a thank you to Marianne for bringing Jenny back into his life and an apology for never marrying her. She understood and never pressured him for marriage. They were content as they were. At the viewing, Marianne informed Jenny how much Steve had missed her and regretted not reaching out sooner. Her mother inquired about it, so Jenny shared some of the details of their reconciliation. She said, he told me that he attended my graduations, but he would hide in the back, away from anyone who might recognize him. That's true, Marianne confirmed. I was with him, he mentioned that he followed my career as I progressed and eventually became a detective in Streamwood. He was incredibly proud of you. He saved clippings from the Herald. You were the youngest person ever to become a detective there. He loved it when they referred to you as having a gift for criminology. And when the paper called you a crime scene prodigy, he was almost in tears Marianne shared. He said it was because of all the Columbo and CSI shows you both watched together when you were younger. He hoped you would end up in Chicago or another big city, working on major cases. Jenny smiled throughout the wake, listening to stories about her father's life after the divorce. She was happy to finally meet Marianne, as they had still maintained occasional contact. His new life seemed as fulfilling as it could have been. He had passed away a content man. She said a final prayer after the funeral, thanking God for bringing him peace. Angela had been attempting to reconnect with Jenny throughout the wake and funeral. However, she ruined her chances at the luncheon after the service when she made an inappropriate comment at the worst possible moment. They were alone, sitting together after everyone else had left, when Angela said, Jenny, I have finally found peace. What are you talking about, Mom? I haven't been able to have a relationship for the past few years because I was afraid your father would harm them. Jenny couldn't believe her ears. He was cleared by the police, you worthless person. But now, you're happy that he's gone so that you can spend time with? You're just as terrible as you always were. I had hoped you had changed, but now I hope you rot in hell. Angela winced. You don't understand Jenny cut her off, saying, The next time I see you, Mother will be when we are laying you to rest no, Jenny. Please try to understand again, she interrupted her, saying, Goodbye, Mother. I hope you find happiness in your love life. That was the last time she ever spoke to her mother. Ten months later, Angela was having dinner with her boyfriend Charlie Harlan at an expensive steakhouse when Charlie got serious. Angela, these last eight months have been so wonderful for me. Squeezing his hand, she said, Me too, Charlie. I wasn't sure I would ever love again, but we found each other, Angela. I love you. Will you marry me? Angela took a deep breath and said, yes. Yes, I'll marry you. There was a pang I'd fear in the pit of her stomach. She softened and thought, he's gone. I have nothing to worry about. One week later, Charlie was sitting on his back deck, thinking about the upcoming wedding and moving Angela in with him. He took a deep puff of his Cuban Monte Cristo too and exhaled the smoke. As he sighed in contentment, the gun was placed to his temple and the trigger was pulled. The gun was put into his hand, the cigar put into the ashtray, and a note was left tucked under the heavy ash bin on the table. The price is paid in full Angela hung up the phone after talking with Detective Jordan. Her face wet with tears after the emotional conversation. She went up to her bathroom and grabbed a bottle of sleeping pills. She hadn't needed. One for a while, but always had them on hand. 
She walked out to her mailbox, placed an envelope in, and lifted the flag to let the mailman know there was outgoing mail. She laid on her bed and thought of her wedding to Steve and what a perfect day it was. She thought of Jenny and how proud she was of her career. She thought of family vacations and trips to the park. She regretted ever meeting Martin Schindler and ruining her own life. Finally, she said a prayer that she would see Steve soon. She placed the note on her chest as she fell asleep for the last time. Her note read, My price is paid in full. Jenny walked in with the mail and a bag of groceries. She set everything down, put her keys in the hook, and kicked her shoes off. Her husband Blake wouldn't be home until almost midnight since he worked second shift as a police officer, so she had the pleasure of a silent house to enjoy. She opened a bottle of California Roots Cabernet and poured a healthy glassful. Taking a drink, she walked over to the pile of mail and saw a letter. Oh my goodness, she cried out when she read the sender's name, Angela Johnson. She tore it open and read her mother's last communication to her. Falling into her chair, tears fell from her eyes as she read what her mother's suicide truly meant. Wow, mother, wow, she said to the empty house. She picked up her cell phone and made a call. Jordan, Detective Jordan, this is Jenny Stanger, Steve and Angela Johnson's daughter, hello, young lady. Sorry to hear about your mother's suicide, thank you. At least hers saved you some investigating. Yes, Harlan, no, but hers, yes. What can I do for you, Jenny? I received a letter in the mail from my mother. It's a confession, what he exclaimed into the phone. It's a confession for all of the deaths. Apparently, she was mentally ill. I can't believe it. Oh, my goodness. Okay, come and meet me at my station as soon as you can. On my way, she took the first page and lit it on fire put in her fireplace, and made sure it burned completely. The letter read, My dearest Jenny, I'm giving you this last gift of my penance. Whether you believe it or not, I love you with all of my heart, and I'm sorry for all of the pain that I've caused you. It was not intentional, and hurting you and your father was the worst thing I've ever done. I knew it had to be you when Charlie was killed, and I accept my punishment. I'm sorry I caused you to punish me in this way and I hope you can now live the rest of your life without the pain of my betrayal of you and your father. Destroy this page and give page two to the police. Page two is my confession for them. I take full responsibility and give you the gift of your freedom. It's all my fault and I can't ever repair your lost years with your dad or your hurt. I've caused so much death and it has to stop. Maybe this will make it up to you and you can finally forgive me and be at peace. Please tell my future grandchildren stories of the good times and not of how I destroyed our lives. I pray that you and Blake have a long and happy marriage. Don't ever fall for it when someone tries to take you from him. I love you with all of my heart. Mom, P.S. Please see someone and get yourself the help that you desperately need. Page 2, Dearest Jenny, by the time you get this, I will already be gone by my own hand. I can't take the guilt any longer. I caused the deaths of all those men, my partners. They all had to pay the price of taking me from your father. I was always his. Maybe now I can join him again. May God forgive me. I will always love you. And I'm sorry I ruined our lives. Until Martin, we truly had a perfect family. Mom Jenny was escorted to Detective Jordan's desk and sat down after exchanging greetings. After he read the letter, he said, Goodness, Jenny, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just can't believe it. She must have really lost it years ago when I stopped talking to her after what she did to my dad. I can't believe she kept dating, just to kill them. Goodness, I just don't get it. It kind of makes sense that it was her. For a couple of the deaths, her alibi wasn't great. We just couldn't place her at the scene, and frankly, we didn't have a good enough case. I always felt it was your father or Schindler's ex-wife, but we couldn't break their alibis either. Well, I'm glad it's all over. The deaths, her pain, everything. Take care, detective. You two Jenny walked out of the police station with a mile-wide smile and shook her head. She stopped as she opened her car door, looked up to the sky, and said, Thanks, Mom. I hope you do find Daddy wherever you are.